Hello ladies and gentlemen, Ollie here, and I hope you're having a fantastic day. Welcome back to the channel. Today, what I thought would be useful to do as one of the first few videos would be to produce a primer uh, for the medical application process. So this video is going to be suitable for anybody who has not been through the medical process before, Who so you've decided that you want to be a doctor, um, which is amazing. I'm sure you'll make a great doctor one day. Uh, but I thought I'd make this video to tell you about the sort of things that you can expect to be dealing with and the sort of things that you need to bear in mind as you make the applications process because obviously a lot of people want to be doctors so what are the sorts of things that universities might be looking for in order to choose the best doctors that is what I'm going to be talking to you about today. So the first thing that we are going to cover in this video is the idea of academic achievement and grades. Now I'm going to be talking in terms of the UK A level here because that's what I went through, that is what most people in the UK will do. This isn't a hard and fast rule, um, there are other qualifications that will be perfectly acceptable in lieu of A levels, it's just that I think they will be the most common um, way that people go about this, so that's what I'm going to cover. So firstly I'm going to talk about school leavers, so this is anybody who you will just sat your AS levels uh, this previous summer and you will be applying to university to go and study next coming September. After you finish your A2 level exams you get your results and you want to go to university, so this first bit is targeted at you. The gold standard, what you are going to be looking for is three a grades at A level, okay? That's kind of the minimum standard everywhere, that's what you want to be looking at. Biology is required by, I think, virtually all schools at the moment. I mean, it's unlikely, I think, that if you wanted to be a doctor, you wouldn't be studying biology A level anyway, but just bear that in mind. And beyond biology, most schools will ask for a second science to full A level, so that's two years of study and they want that to grade A as well. Um, so your options are obviously maths, physics, or chemistry, and the remaining sciences. Ignore further maths for now, I will talk more about further maths another time. Um, but basically those two science A levels are what most places are going to want. So biology is a minimum, and then usually most other schools, if they are going to stipulate something, will stipulate chemistry. So for most applicants, you are looking at biology and chemistry to A grade at A level, to be the most competitive you can be. There are other options and I recommend you to look those up, but they're a great place to start. And once you've got those two sorted, the third A level doesn't seem to be massively influential from the research that I've been able to do. In fact, there's a few schools that will actually welcome applicants with kind of a different third subject, something that might make you a bit more interesting. Uh, so my advice would be for your third A-level slot, so you've got biology and chemistry to go first, remember, but for your third slot, simply do something that you will enjoy and something that you will do well in, because what's most important is getting that third A grade. If they don't care what it is, um, you know, take something that you're just where you're going to get that A grade because that's what's ultimately important. And if you're applying as a graduate or someone who will be a graduate when the time comes, so I applied when I was in my second year at university, uh, I applied over the summer um, before I went into my third year. For you out there, you will be looking at a 2 1, essentially an upper second class honours degree uh, to be, again, maximally competitive. This will want to be in a science subject, I think ideally something like a life science, so some aspect of biology or physiology. But schools tend to vary a bit more at this level, and there are actually a few medical schools that will take graduates of any discipline. Go and check the particular requirements of the school that you're interested in applying to, because they vary so much. And if you've got your heart set on a particular school that, that maybe wants you know, they want that third A level to be in physics or maths or something, it's far better to identify that early on than try and deal with it later when it's much more difficult to do so. Now the next thing we need to talk about are entrance exams. So of course, you know, if you set a minimum cutoff for grades, you're expecting a certain number of people to hit those grades. While it is true, you know, your three A grades is difficult to get. I, I don't want to gloss over that, but obviously because they are there, 
some percentage of students will get those three A grades and a percentage again will get more, they will get their A stars and things like that. So what else can universities use to assess how good people are going to be? The answer to that is entrance exams. So these are separate psychometric tests that you take uh, separately to your A-levels. Each university has their own one that they prefer, but for school leavers, by far the most common one that you're going to see is the UKCAT, the United Kingdom Clinical Aptitude Test. The UKCAT has to be booked separately, so you take it in your own time, usually over the summer, and it must be sat between the 3rd of July and the 3rd of October, I believe is usually the cutoff. Alternatively, there are a few schools which will ask for the BMAT, the Biomedical Admissions Test, which again is subject to its own cutoff. Now it's really important to note here, okay, that the UK CAT is sat before your application goes away to the universities. Once the 15th of October comes round, your application is sent and you can no longer change the schools that you've applied to, whereas the BMAT, the other one that I mentioned, is sat after this deadline. So what this obviously means is that you can sit the UK cap early on before your application goes away, maybe even before you've considered what schools you want to apply to, and then if that goes well you can apply to more schools that use the UK cap in their entry, whereas if it doesn't you can give yourself the chance of sitting the BMAT, which might help. Of course, do bear in mind that they are different tests that examine different aspects of your thinking, so do bear that in mind as well if that is a path that you're considering taking. So the next thing that we need to talk about is the actual application system. It's called UCAS, the Universities and Colleges Admission System, I believe, and all medical applications are sent through this system, no matter if you're applying as a school leaver or as a graduate. All medical courses in the UK are undergraduate courses, so they're handled through this system. So firstly, you'll just have to provide a load of personal information, so this will include things like your address and your previous academic attainment, so things like your GCSEs, for example. One of the two major components of this part is the personal statement. It's 4,000 characters long, which, believe me, is much shorter than it sounds. I'm going to make many more videos and write many more articles discussing the personal statement at length, but in short, what it's going to indicate is your motivation for studying medicine, first and foremost, then why you think you'd be good at it, that's the second part. Think of it almost as like a, a job interview type thing, you're looking to sell yourself. And the third thing is really, have you considered the reality of the career? Do you have some understanding of what it might actually be like to work as a doctor? And the second component of the UCAS application is your reference. So this cannot be written by you, you will need to go out and find somebody willing to write you one. So for example, if you're at school, this might be your head of sixth form, or an administrator in your college, or a teacher maybe that knows you well. This will vary depending on your particular school and how they like to handle these kinds of things. It would be best, obviously, if the person in question has some previous experience of writing a personal statement for medicine because it's one of the subjects where it becomes a bit more important because it's so competitive. That's not to say it's not for other degrees, but what you've got to think is that the people looking at them will have processed hundreds if not thousands of personal statements and there'll be particular elements that you want to get right, so finding someone with previous experience would be really helpful. If this isn't feasible, however, and it won't be for a large number of people, then I will explore this on this channel and on the website postgradmedic.com in more depth. I will get interviews um, with admissions writers and things like that on how to get a good reference written for you, but if not, there's plenty of guidance available online and at the UCAS website. Whether your referee chooses to share the details of this with you is entirely up to them, and again, depends entirely on the individual. And again, this is sent by the administration, whoever is handling your application. You do not send this yourself. So number four on the list today is work experience, and it goes back to what I was saying before about making sure that you understand what the career of a doctor is actually going to be like. I think the media often glamorises, might be the best word, um, glamorises medics, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about things like casualty, um, 
and things like that which is just basically people having a lot of sex in hospitals and never actually treating anybody for anything. And obviously while these things are fantastic to watch, particularly if you are interested in medicine, the subject matter naturally will be to you, but they might not offer the best representation of the actual career. I think it's more than worth the time and effort to get some relevant work experience so you understand just a little bit more, and particularly if you're young, just look for things like maybe volunteering at a nursing home or with, with a kids reading group or working in a pharmacy or something like that just so you get a bit of an idea about the sorts of environments that healthcare practitioners work in. But quickly, once again, I have to say that every school has their own preferences when it comes to this sort of thing. Some people might demand it, some institutions might not care at all. However, I will say at graduate level, so this is if you're already applying with a degree, it tends to be looked at more closely or the, the minimum demands might be higher, because obviously if you're seven, 16, 17, I guess you'd be 17 probably, turning 18, um, if you were applying from school, because you're so young, the experiences that you're likely to have achieved, because you will have been in full-time education, you're obviously less able to get those um, that great exposure, whereas they're less tolerant of that obviously the older you get. So, on to the last section of the video. Now, if you have satisfied all the previous criteria and impressed the right person at the right time, then you might find yourself the lucky recipient of an invitation to interview. I remember getting mine through, I was absolutely, like, dumbfounded. You'll be over the moon, as you have every right to be. It's one of the best things in the world. Now, there are several types of interview that are used by different schools to pick from the candidates that they've already pulled together to make sure they get the best ones, or what they perceive to be the best ones. Now, once again, I will discuss this in much more depth in the future in another video and in another article, but long story short, you will go to the university in person to meet with somebody, or indeed a few people, and they're going to decide whether you deserve the place or not. It could be about the contents of your reference, of the things that your referee wrote about you, it could be your work experience, your understanding of the NHS, it could really be anything. But ultimately, they're trying to assess your suitability for studying medicine. Do they think that based on what they can tell about you from this short interview, that you would be suitable to become a doctor? Now, this is nothing to be nervous about, just think that the interviewers are trying to glean as much as they can about you. All you've been to them so far is a few pieces of paper with some ink on it, right? They've never met you. Medicine requires a very large range of skills, and one of the most important ones is obviously communication. So while that will be one of the main ones being tested, it certainly won't be the only one. They're looking for a holistic image of you. But if it all goes well, and I'm sure it will, you'll be great. You will hear back in the not too distant future, with your invitation to come and study medicine in September. So there you have it guys, that was my attempt to give you a short primer on what the medical application process is like as a whole. I'm obviously going to talk about each of the little elements in much more depth in other videos. I just wanted to give you as good an image as I can about the overarching process and the sorts of things that you might want to be keeping in mind if you think that you'd make a great doctor, and I'm sure you will. If you want to ask me any questions, please feel absolutely free. I'd love to hear from you anything about the process at all. I've been through it successfully, so I know what it's like. And please share this video. I want this information to get out there to as many people as possible so that everyone has the best chance they can get of being able to apply and become the best doctors of tomorrow. Take care of yourselves, guys. Stay learning, and I will see you in another video. Bye-bye for now.